Welcome to the Niche Pursuits Podcast. Today we are joined by Jason Wilson, who is a part of the Epic Gardening team. Now, Jason has been building websites and involved in website creation for a long time. Jason actually started by getting to know Spencer. They both were in the banking industry together. So Jason has been around for quite a while. He joins us today to tell his story, his origin story about how he got involved in websites. He actually worked for Niche Pursuits and Spencer for many years. We get to hear about the backstory from someone who's been in this industry for a long time. He's had several big exits, including a seven-figure website sale, but we spend the bulk of the time today talking about his latest project, All About Gardening. This site is, uh, I believe, less than two years old, but was getting four million page views per month when he merged with uh, uh, Kevin at, uh, at Epic Gardening. Now, we had Kevin on earlier in the podcast a couple months ago, so you can listen to the Epic Gardening story, but Jason comes on and spends the bulk of the time telling us exactly how he grew this website so fast, The strategies he used, everything from content creation to hiring experts to topical authority to building backlinks or not building backlinks, PR, content velocity, all of the above. And then at the very end, we get to hear from Jason about why he ended up merging with Epic Gardening and the reasons for that and then what they have in store for them. It's a longer interview, but there's so much to cover. Jason has been around for quite a while. Uh, he's, uh, he's actually been a valuable friend of mine for many, many years and mentored me. Uh, and I think you're going to learn a lot from someone who's been involved with Niche Pursuits uh, on and off for quite a while. I hope you enjoy. Before we jump into the podcast, I wanted to let you know that today's episode is sponsored by Search Intelligence. Here's a short clip of Ferry from Search Intelligence showing you how their agency built digital PR links to a client's website. What a crazy campaign. How to sleep on your back. This campaign got us links in Huffington Post, Glamour Magazine, Mirror, and lots of other great news publications. Let me show you how we've done it. It was so simple. Our sleep client provided us with expert commentary about how to train yourself to fall asleep on your back. They also gave advice on why it's best to sleep on your back. Once we've had this information, we went to Muckrack and searched for journalists that consistently write about sleep and well-being. We've sent these journalists the advice provided by the client and within one day the links started flowing in. Glamour Magazine, a DR81 website, picked it up. Huffington Post, DR88, Mirror UK, DR90, a massive avalanche of links blasted through our client's website with this simple yet effective campaign about how to sleep on your back. I hope this inspires and I hope you'll use this technique to land massive links to your or your client's website. If you want similar link building PR campaigns for your website, head to search-intelligence.co.uk and get in touch with them now. All right, welcome back to the Niche Pursuits podcast. My name is Jared Bauman and today we are joined by Jason Wilson, who is the head of search at Epic Gardening. Jason, welcome to the podcast. Thank you very much, sir. Appreciate it. It could be a fun one. I have known Jason personally for a good number of years. I would call him a mentor, actually. I'm sure we'll get into it. You have a long track record with niche pursuits as well, which we'll get into. And now you're with Epic Gardening, which we'll get into. A lot of stuff yeah. to unpack. I don't know how we're going to get it all done in an hour here, but... Um, Man, where should we start? Let's start with the origin story. Tell us about you and your how you got into internet marketing and, and, and websites. Yeah, for sure. So um, first off, thanks for having me on. It's probably uh, overdue just because Spencer and yeah. I, we go back a ways and uh, he's been bugging me about coming back onto the podcast for a while. Um, for those that don't know me, um, I met Spencer back in... Oh boy, this was probably the mid 2000s. We were both in uh, mortgage banking with Wells Fargo. Uh, we worked together as at a branch, and um, I met him there. And he, we were doing mortgages, residential mortgage loans. We were we were selling them to consumers, and he would always talk about how on the side he was going to start these websites on buffalo nickels and worm farms and all this fun stuff. So he, I, I always, I enjoyed talking to him just because he had these wild ideas and. Um, then fast forward, you know, I a decade later, I'm still in mortgage banking. I had worked my way up in the, the corporate space and was running 
sales teams and uh, and I ran back into Spencer again because he lived in the area. We both lived in uh, Arizona at the time. And um, we, we ran into each other and I started following him on Niche Pursuits. I started listening to him and I was like, hey, this is kind of cool. Like I wouldn't mind doing what – like he had fully – like right around the time – he had left corporate was when I was like really um, honed in on what he was doing. And I was like, this would be awesome. I'd love to leave this grind. I was working like you know, 80 hours a week in, in mortgage banking at the time. And I was like, I'd love to get back to like controlling my own time and, and um, you know, living my life on my terms. I started following him, um, started building websites on the side as kind of just like an experimenting thing. And, you know, God bless Spencer. He put up with my, you know, 50 million questions when I first started, like I didn't even know what internet hosting was. And he, he kind of, you know, nurtured me through some of that. So this is probably back in like 2013. Uh, so about 10 years ago now when I first started, um, I was just building sites, uh, on the side. It took me about a year to a year and a half to get one that was actually making any type of meaningful revenue. Um, and then I sold, a site for like, I sold two sites in like, I think it was like 2016. And that was what like got me hooked. Um, wasn't for a lot of, it wasn't like life changing money for me at that time, but it was enough for me to be like, okay, like this is actually like, you know, this works. Like we can, we can do something like this. Um, and then I started, I, I basically knuckled down at that point. So I'm gonna focus on, on one site. That's all I'm going to do. I'm going to make this my priority. Um, and so I started doing that and that was kind of like my springboard. It was enough to where, it basically replaced my it replaced my day job income. I still stayed working at the corporate day job um, just because it had great benefits. And even though I was working a ton, I had progressed into a different position within the the corporate um, mortgage banking organization and had a little bit more time. I was probably doing about sixty to seventy hours a week instead of eighty. So I had a little bit more time back, and I was I was like, I'm just going to focus on this, build this site. That's what I did. Eventually, got to the point where it replaced my day job income. And then I jumped into working for Spencer. And that's probably around the time where a lot of people on, on that have followed Spencer through the years may have remember meeting me from was um, I started working for Spencer around, I think it was 2017 or so. I started working for Spencer full time. So I left the corporate job because my, my primary site had replaced that income. And then working for Spencer, um, I just knew that moving into this industry full time, um, the pay was going to be less because I was in corporate banking. You know, I was making a, a fairly decent corporate salary at that point, and I just said, "Hey, I've got this site. This is this is paying for my living expenses. I can go work for Spencer and learn from him and watch how he runs successful businesses." And so I took a small pay cut, jump making that jump, and, and started working from him for there. That was when you and I met. I went back and looked it up. We met the summer of 2017, yeah. um, and when you were working with Niche Pursuits and uh, yeah. you know. Uh, I won't go into all that, but how long did you end up working for Niche Pursuits? Because you were on the podcast many times. Yeah. You were a part of a lot of the projects. I wrote, I wrote um, some of the content that's still on the site today. <laughs> I've, I've got an article today about car flipping that's still out there because I, I have flipped a few classic Mustangs in my day. Those were my my favorite cars because my first car was a, a 67 Mustang when I was 16. So I, I flipped a couple and I even wrote an article about it on Niche Pursuits. It still ranks today. Um, so yeah, so I, I worked for Spencer for about two years. Um, I ran, um, I co-ran, uh, uh, niche pursuits insider was like a group of his and that's where, where you and I met, you were in that group and we did some, some coaching calls and, uh, it was, it was great. Um, I actually didn't plan on, on leaving Spencer at all. Um, it just so happened that I ended up, uh, sorry, my dog is running after something. So you're going to need to cut that. Um, so I, I didn't plan on leaving working for Spencer at all. Um, I had planned on working for him for a while. Uh, just what ended up happening is a couple years into into working for Spencer, I we got it into our crazy heads. We'd lived in Arizona our entire lives. We got it into our heads. We wanted to try something different um, and move to Tennessee where my wife has family. And so we were going to move to a farm in Tennessee and we were going to live out kind of this homestead lifestyle dream that we had. Um, and that in theory, sounds wonderful, um, but it wasn't. Uh, we had a bit of a, a, a real estate uh, nightmare. We bought a home that I thought I was going to be working from home remotely on my farm all day long with my family. Well, it turns out the home, the internet that the home got wasn't enough to support me working from home. And this is before like 
high speed internet was more available. It was, you know, I would have had to have, uh, satellite would have been the only option. Um, it was just a really, really bad decision on the, the, on that. Um, looking back on it now, I can say it was a bad decision at the time, but it's actually a good decision because all the things that have happened since then wouldn't have happened if we hadn't had to, to go through that. Um, but yeah, so we moved to Tennessee and um, we were there for 10 days and decided this is not for us. We literally left all of our stuff in our, in our uh, packed um, trailer and just said, we're going straight back, turn around. And, and um, literally my mom was out of town and here I am in my, my mid thirties crashing in my mom's place for a few weeks. So we try and figure out like how we're putting our lives back together. So it was a, it was a, a wild time. Um, and so that was kind of what led me to like no longer working for Spencer. I loved working for Spencer. It wasn't anything to do with that. It was, you know, that was supposed to be at the time, like the springboard to, I'm going to work for Spencer as long as I can. My website that I have is eventually going to to pay for living expenses and plus so I can scale it. Um, but instead, uh, there were other plans for us and we ended up where we were kind of fishing around at, uh, at rock bottom, trying to piece our lives back together. So, um, I remember, I remember, you know, just being friends messaging you and you were like, uh, yeah. yeah, I'm back in Arizona again. I'm like, wait, you just moved to Tennessee. Is, <laughs> yeah. I think I was checking in with you on how the move went. You're back in Arizona. Yeah. It, was, it was a mess. Well, it, was, I mean, it was a huge mess. Um, you know, my loving wife, bless her heart, like she, you know, it was really hard on her because we've been in the same house for, you know, it was eight, nine years. And, you know, she, it wasn't that we didn't like where we lived. We did. She had her, her friends and we had, you know, people we knew. We just wanted to try this kind of like ideal, you know, idealistic dream in, in Tennessee and try something different. Um, so it was, it was a rough time, um, for sure. And that actually led me back. So I left Spencer. I went back into corporate banking for about a year. Um, I did that because, you know, just monetarily, uh, pay wise, we needed to do it to kind of fix, you know, I've, I've got four kids. We had to kind of fix what had gone wrong in our lives at, the, at that point financially. So I took the job to get us back in a, in a house that was in a, in a, in our, in the neighborhood that we had, had left to try and get some sort of normalcy, um, to our, to our lives at that point. And that was when I sold, I, so I decided to sell, I decided to sell the site that had been doing well at that point. So the site that was going to be my springboard, I ended up having to sell it to basically fix this house. We took a massive loss on, on the home, like six figures loss between down payment and what we had to pay to get out from underneath it and all that. It was, it was a huge mess. So we sold, sold the site for a, a multiple six figure amount. Um, that was in 2000 and what, 2000 and this would have been 2018. Yeah. 2018. So we sold that 2018. That was like my first big sale where in the midst of all the chaos, I was like, Hey, like this sucks, but this thing is still, still like, there's, there's still this potential out there. Um, it sucks that I had to de- you know, go through what I went through, um, to, to, you know, sacrifice it, so to speak. But again, it, things ended up working out later on. Um, so yeah, so that, that was like that, that big sale where I first big, like big sale, multiple six figures where I was like, okay, like, yeah, luckily we were able to fix all the garbage that happened in our life. Um, and, and still kind of reset, so to speak. Um, it just, you know, wasn't, wasn't, uh, ideal the way it all worked out. We're going to focus today's interview on your most recent website, but I yeah. mean, you've had a history of being able to, I'll say grow sites quickly and yeah. then sell them on and then start a new sure. project and grow it pretty quickly. Yeah. Um, maybe just so we can kind of get into the meat and potatoes of the, of the specific site, maybe just catch us up to from where we, where you left off with selling this site and kind of yep. <laughs> disastrous situation to yeah. now where we're at. Cause you have some things that happen in between there that are pretty noteworthy. I'll, I'll mention. Yeah. Yeah. So I'll, I'll fast forward a bit. So, um, we, we basically kind of hit that rock bottom point. Um, and then we were still, we moved back into the, the old neighborhood that we were in and I, I, we were there and we we're just kind of like, man, this just doesn't feel right. We feel like we, you know, kind of like tried to put the toothpaste back into the tube a bit. Um, and we just got it in our, on our minds that we wanted to try it again. So, Crazy enough, I got a job offer um, in 2019 to relocate to Tennessee to move to the Nashville area, working for a company called Better Collective. Um, they are a aggregator. They run uh, a bunch of sites in the sports, uh, fantasy sports space and sports betting space. 
and I, you know, again, I was exiting corporate banking again because I was like, I, I like, I just got to get out of this. This is not where I want to be for the rest of my life. Um, so I, again, took another massive pay cut to get back into SEO, but I wanted to do the sports betting thing because I knew just from my time in the industry, that was like, it was like the push of my ethical boundaries. Like that was right around where like, I wasn't willing to go into any other like niches that didn't align with like, you know, my thoughts morally. Um, so I, I decided I want to get into this cause it's really hard sports betting and sports gaming is like one of the hardest um, places that you can be in SEO if you're going to be in it for a career. And I was like, I want to do the hardest stuff I possibly can to like prep myself. So we did that. Uh, I took the job. We relocated again from Arizona all the way back out to Tennessee uh, as 2019 pre COVID. And then four months here, um, uh, four months prior to us moving, a few months prior to us moving, I started another, another site. I had, I had taken a little bit of the money from that multiple six figure sale as kind of like a seed fund and said, I'm going to use this to start the next site, use it to jumpstart a site was building that during our transition back out here. We moved here pre COVID COVID hits all of a sudden for the next year and a half, I have the, you know, we're remote. Uh, so my commute from where I live to Nashville, it kills my commute. I no longer, I've got like two and a half hours back in my day where I can just grind. And so um, I worked on that from 2019 to 2021 um, and just hustled hard on that. Um, basically, all my time outside of my day job was spent on, on that side hustle. Can't talk about the, the niche that it was in, um, but I exited that site. That was a seven-figure exit, and that was in late 2021. Um, so that was like kind of like the, you know, the big moment of like, all this crazy stuff had happened to us for years. We kind of went through the, the cycle of just like feeling pretty dang beat up. And then um, we had the, the seven figure exit, which was great. That was pretty much the big like financial reset for us. And um, it, it goes fast. Like, you know, you got taxes, you've got, you've got broker fees, you've got all, you know, the, 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 we had taken on debt. So that, again, I'd made some stupid financial decisions. I, I guess it wasn't stupid. It was actually smart looking back at it, but other people would have looked at us like we were crazy. Like we moved out here to Tennessee with nothing. Um, I think we had like 20 or 30 grand in our bank accounts, which I shouldn't say is nothing. That's a lot of money for, for some people. But for us, when you got a family of six moving across country, like it was, it was scary. Uh, we had nothing in our pocket, put most of our money on this down payment, started working at this company, went into debt to build this, this other business. And then it just ended up where it, it, it worked out and we ended up being able to sell it for seven figures. So that kind of like reset the whole table. Um, and that kind of brings us to where we're at, where we're at more or less today. So I used that sale, um, took 20% of it and set it aside and just said, we're going to use this as what I did the last time, you know, um, there are multiple people in the SEO space who focus, you can kind of do, you know, there's lots of different ways to skin the SEO cat, so to speak. Some people like to build a big portfolio, use that to replace their day job income, and then just stay working for themselves forever. Um, there's people like me, which I didn't set out to be like someone who, who buys, builds, and sells. It's just kind of happened that way where, you know, I'm, I'm a few years in and I've been able to sell. Um, and so there's, there's lots of ways. I still have a portfolio. I still have sites that, you know, I've, held, um, that, that have made revenue, but this was the, the big one in 2021 where I just said, look, this is going to level set us. We exited and then we set aside that kind of seed fund to start all about gardening, which was the, the most recent one that was, that I had that was acquired. I mean, I will say as someone who's been a part of your life and, you know, like you and I are friends on a level where I know about a lot of your sites and we talk about yeah. How to grow stuff and you know a lot of us we talk about websites in this community but we don't necessarily share the exact specifics and stuff but i can say publicly right. that you have a knack for being able to take a, a site and grow it quickly and then exit and i yeah. think it's admirable because you continuously do it and you Thanks. stick to a lot of us get shiny object syndrome and we're like cool like i did this well let me now go try something different yeah. but you really understand where your strengths are and you seem to continually replicate it. So, um, uh, yeah, you know, seven figure exit. And then you kind of replicated that in a different space when it comes to all about gardening. I don't actually yeah. know the financials of that transaction, but growing a site quickly, getting it to a point right. and then exiting it. It's just, it's really emblematic because that's hard to do in a couple of years, which you continually seem to do. Yeah. So, so I'll say this, like it's, you know, a lot of people, there are people out there who specifically start websites with the, the thought of exiting. When I started that site, 
um, that, that, which ended up being the seven figure exit. I didn't think I was going to exit it at all. I started it because I was passionate about the space and I wanted to actually stay in the space. It just so happened that we, you know, 2021, this was like peak of when, you know, website valuations were kind of at the top. Um, and things were good. And I was like, Hey, this just makes sense for us to do. So we'd actually planned on, on holding that one. Um, and it's funny because I still know the, the owners, um, the site's still performing very well. Um, it's one of those things where if I'm going to let something go, I want to make sure that the next owner that has that business has an asset that they can hold and will still perform for them. Um, obviously none of us know what the future is going to bring, but it was set up about as well as it, it could be set up. Um, so I think that to answer, I guess to chime off on what you said, part of the reason why I think I've been able to replicate success in the SEO space is because when I start something, I don't necessarily say I'm going to exit it. Like I usually start it with the mindset, like I want to keep it and hold it for a long time. There's an exit strategy there that I can take if it makes sense to do so. Um, but that's not necessarily the goal when I start it. And I think that's what actually helps is like knowing that I'm getting into both, both the bigger exits, so to speak, have been in sites where like, if you told me I was going to work in that space for the next 10 years, I'd be like, dude, that's great. Like I'm fine working in that space and, you know, just, just running there because I enjoy it. So I think that's, that's key, you know, and, and you don't have to do it that way. There are a lot of people who have sites in, in niches that they don't, um, you know, they don't love, so to speak. Um, and that's fine. But for me, I just, I, if I'm going to be working on something, I want to enjoy what I'm working on or, or understand about the topic, if that makes sense. Well, let's use that as a springboard. It's late 2021. You've exited yeah. a seven figure exit. And for some crazy reason, you don't want to take any time off. You want to dive right back in and start another yeah. website. Uh, yeah. you know, I'm being sarcastic. I mean, I can see why after a large exit and you have a formula, there's all the reason in the world not to go out and try to do it again. Sure. Let's talk about what you dove into. It's, it, the site is all about gardening. Um, yeah. How did you, I mean, from the outset, that strikes me as a fairly competitive niche. Not that that scares mm -hmm. you. Um, it also strikes me as something that, um, uh, you know, like how much experience did you have? And it, like, let's talk about niche selection. Yeah. Let's talk about how you picked and let's talk about how you got that site off the ground. Yeah. So um, niche selection, I just said, what's, what's a, what's a passion? What's a hobby? And once we moved to Tennessee, we started gardening just as a, as a hobby. Cause we're in a place where we get lots of rain now. So we actually can garden. So I, we've been doing that since we moved here. Um, get, you know, just dabbling at first, but then getting a little bit more serious, uh, once we've been here for a year and a half. And, and so when I exited in 2021, I was just like, it just made, I, it freeze for me. It was like, this just makes sense because I enjoy it. Um, I'm going to be outside doing it anyway, so I can take pictures. Um, you know, if I wanted to do video, I kind of thought about that at one point, but I was like, Hey, like there, we can do things because we live in a place where the environment allows it. Um, and then I started doing some, some, you know, niche research, the typical SEO research that someone might do where you're looking at keywords, like, you know, looking at, intent like are, are people are, are the articles that are ranking in this in this space truly answering what the person is searching um and seeing that no like a lot of times you would see these like massive guides that were ranking for like certain keywords that were not targeting what the user might be looking for and so there, i just found that plus a lot of sites that were like you know newer that um were ranking well and i was like this is there's just it was just so broad and that's the, that's I think a key with niche selection, right? You want to make sure that you're not limiting yourself. Like I probably wouldn't have like started a site like just on hydrangeas or something like that. Although they're out there and they do, you know, I'm sure I, I think there's sites out there that do and they do well. Um, but I, I would, I didn't want to limit myself to like just something so specific. I wanted to give myself broad opportunity. And again, it was just something that I was passionate about. Um, I actually considered gardening, um, uh, the, the first time around when I had the, the multiple six figure exit, um, but I, it was on the board of like, I thought about doing it in, in 2018 and said, okay, we're going to, you know, shelve this one because the other one I went to, I just had an opportunity that I had to jump on. So, um, it was already teed up. Um, and so really that's what it started with was, well, you know, Hey, I enjoy it. This is something we can do. It's, you know, something my wife and I are passionate about um, and living in Tennessee just gave us a perfect opportunity to, to jump in and, and do that. The competition didn't scare me, I think, to your question, because I've been doing this for long enough now and seeing 
having been able to work at, at BC and Better Collective and work in the sports industry and dealing with the competition that's there, um, I, it did, the competition just didn't, didn't scare me, um, because I've seen some of the, the, some of the more aggressive stuff that you can get into in the, the gaming space. And surprisingly that, you know, where I came from at Better Collective, they're very white hat. Uh, everything is like, you know, they're all brand properties, very focused on brand PR, making sure you've got really great writers, editorial, like different than you would think a, a t- traditional like gaming company would be, but it helped me like view it like that job was fantastic. I met some great people there and it really helped me to like view building a website as not building a website, but building it as a business, like seeing it as like, it's, it's editorial and publishing. And so that's the way I approached all about gardening. When I, when I built it, I said, I want to be, you know, I want to be the next gardening know-how. How do I do that? Um, and the, the answer was you gotta, you gotta have a big budget. Um, so that's why I took 20% of that, that sale and said, we're just going to start throwing stuff at the wall and see what sticks and uh, set aside a big budget for that. And then I went out and I started finding people who like, I was a hobby gardener, but I was nowhere near an expert. And I was like, I knew I was going to need to get experts. So I, hiring was critical. And I know we'll probably talk about that a little bit, but th- that was where I started immediately with my budget. I said, we're going to, we're going to take the budget content and hiring is going to be like prior number one. Why? And I ask why more to get into the nuances. Is it yeah. Like I'm gonna start dropping a bunch of SEO terms on you, but yeah, it's fine. Is it because of EEAT? Is it because you didn't have expertise that was documented and you wanted it? Is it because you wanted to scale content writing faster than you could produce on your own, and so you hired people like all of the above? Like, why did you carve Absolutely. out so much budget, and why did you yeah. make the choices you made? Absolutely, all of the above. Um, but also because I wanted to test some things, and and you need to have a little bit of money to test some things too. Um, I wanted to test some things socially and I wanted to test some things, um, you know, just different types of content that just didn't have any like search intent at all. Um, nothing like not SEO focused at all, just to see if it's something that could, that could stick or that readers would enjoy. But th- I guess really to answer your question was I stopped, you know, this happened with the, the previous site. I did the same thing there. I stopped thinking of it as like, I know this sounds so corny and there are going to be some people be like, Oh, who, you know, I, I don't want to hear you say this, but Truth be told, I started thinking from a user perspective. I started thinking of if I landed on a page that was going to teach me how to grow dahlias, who did I want to learn it from? I wanted to learn it from someone who who grew dahlias and someone who maybe had some type of certification in that space. So I stopped thinking about it so much from an SEO perspective and started thinking about it from a user perspective of what does the user want when they actually land on the page? I can tell you right now, if I'm going to read about dahlias, I'm going to go to a page that's a big publisher. And if it's not written by someone who I can see has credible expertise in that space, I'm probably going to bounce and I'm going to go find someone who has credible expertise in that space and who has some unique pictures and can tell me exactly how to do what I'm looking to do. Um, And so I just really, again, I I use the same approach when I built the prior seven figure exit was very similar. I don't think I was thinking about it in like a, it was still like thinking about it from like an SEO and like a blog perspective, but the exp- the EAT was, was, or EEAT now, it was EAT back then, was still important for, for me in the prior site, but it just became more important to me because I was like, look, I want to do this and I'm going to do it the right way and I'm going to make sure that these people know what they're talking about. It also was from, you know, you we mentioned outsourcing. I wanted a bunch of content early on. Like I wanted to just like start blasting a site with content immediately, high quality, really well-written content and getting experts who know what they're talking about saves you a whole lot of time on the editing side. Um, and that was, that was a big deal for me because I was essentially like, you know, in the early days, I was the acting managing editor. I had to, you know, proof all these pieces. I had to read every single piece to make sure, you know, I, yeah, I used Grammarly and tools to help like refine and make sure the content um, like read appropriately to pick up like grammatical errors and stuff, but hiring experts really, really cuts down on your editing time because they know what the heck they're talking about. And so that was, you know, it was important that I had a budget set aside. It was important to hire experts. And I knew that was just going to cost a little bit more. Um, it was going to cost more to hire them because, you know, hiring experts isn't cheap. And so, um, that was, that was the goal from day one was to find people who were more, 
the people who had more knowledge than I did in this space. I had hobby gardener level knowledge, but I wanted to find people who were certified master gardeners, horticulturalists, uh, people who have horticulture degrees, people who just really knew, um, who had experience in the plant space. And that was very important to me. I always like to ask this. I think now's a good time. And then we'll get back into the nitty gritty of how you grew it. Yeah. But people always like to hear where it's at. And I know that you have a transition that you went through in joining Epic Gardening, which we'll get into. So I like to yeah. tease, keep people interested, right? But yeah, sure. um, maybe talk about where All About Gardening is today at time of at time of transition and that sort of thing so people know yeah. how big it is and then we'll get back into some sure. of the nitty-gritty because i have some more questions about how you started this site yeah so i would say um like it's it's doing very well uh still today it's doing it was you know during peak season was doing several million page views a month i don't know the exact number um, but probably you know around four million page views all in um during during peak season um, that's a combination. It's not just all organic. That's everywhere. Organic, social, all, all of the above. Mm -hmm. um, so it was, was doing well. Um, and, you know, I'll give you, you know, we'll get into the, like the joining Epic Gardening and I'll, I'll kind of talk about like why and, and when, but it, you know, it's still doing well. Um, you know, we could talk a little bit. Why don't we talk a little bit about how I, how I grew it? Like, I think maybe that makes sense to touch on how, like it was maybe talk about how we integrated the writers and how we scaled that up because that was a challenge in the beginning. Well, and I just want people to get a perspective. Growing a site to say four million page views, yeah, across social and organic in two years. I want people yeah. to hear. So now when we talk about the scale you went for and you they hear about the depths that you went into with how you integrated writers and that sort of thing, I think it'll have a bigger impact because when I hear about the level of um, or the depth that you go through with your writing team, I think that sounds like a lot of work. But then when I hear that you're getting 4 million page views, I start to say, well, maybe it's worth it. Obviously yeah. it's worth it. Um, but you know, I want people to understand like that tug and pull because you've got a lot of people out there who are going the opposite way, right? Almost back to yeah. where your first site was, where you write all the content yourself, you have a very limited budget until the site starts making money. And I, I just love the different perspective that you've been able to bring as you've kind of matured in your site building over the years. Yeah, yeah. So that's uh, so great feedback. What I, and what I would say is I definitely approached all about gardening differently. It, I like, and this is what I would advise anybody that is like just starting out, like still writing content for their site. If you're getting, if you're just in the early stages of like, you're getting your sites generating revenue, don't quit your day job. <laughs> like, you know, when I went into all about gardening, I had, you know, a nice chunk set aside to start investing right away. And I basically said, you know, no risk it, no biscuit. Like I'm going to, I'm going to put my money where my mouth is. And I knew, I basically said, you know, looked at my wife straight in the face. I was like, I may never get any of this money back. And we're just going to have to be okay with that. Um, if you are, if you are building a site and it's getting to the point where it's earning some revenue, stay at your day job as long as you can and take that revenue that you're earning and reinvest it back into, into duplicating content or find out how you can replicate yourself so you can write more content and just get more out. Like at the end of the day, it's a numbers game. And that doesn't mean to, to churn out like just garbage content. That's not, mm -hmm. that's not going to work. It's not going to propel anybody forward, especially in today's day and age. It may have worked, you know, five years ago or even three years ago to some extent, but today's day and age, Google is just getting better and better at reading what's good and what's not. Um, you've got to have great content, whether it's you or hiring. The best advice I could give would be to, if you are looking to build a site that has job replacing income, keep your bills paid as much as you can with your day job income and take every penny you're making and reinvest it into to growth within, within reason. Um, or if you, you're in a place where, you know, you have a job and maybe you got an annual bonus or something like that, and you've got 15 to 20 grand to just start sinking, just start to play. Um, just go out, hire writers, you know, do your keyword research and just invest right away and know that you're not going to get that return back. It could be a year. It could be a year and a half. Um, but I felt fairly confident having gone through that first seven figure exit, you know, in my skill set to say, look, I may never see this money again, but it's, I'm probably going to based on my track record. But as with any business venture, there was risk. So I just immediately started um, plowing that in. And I think by month three, we were doing 60 to 90 articles a month by month three after launching. And I just basically did a, you know, I 
you know, I had a spreadsheet that uh, I had given out to a bunch of people a while back. I think maybe even the Niche Pursuits audience had access to it. A bunch of people had access to it. Anyway, it was a content planning spreadsheet and it just came down to math. Like, yes, you're going to need to have backlinks at some point because you have, you know, content that you're promoting and that's a signal to Google that your site is real and that you're going to start, you know, that you're, that you're credible. It's, it's the vouchers of authority, so to speak. You're going to, you're going to need links. Um, but you, links don't matter if you don't have content, you got to have a great base of content to start. And so I just said, look, I want to have a thousand articles at the end of this year. And if I'm going to do that, here's the math to get there. I'm going to have to do, you know, 60 a month to 90 a month to get there. And I just broke it down into lowest common denominator and said, is this achievable? Can I even do this? You know, it, it, if you're just starting out writing right now, it may seem like a grind to do four articles a week. How can you get to, to five articles a week, to seven articles a week, to 30 a month? Can you do it on your own? Or are you going to have to hire? Like it, come, it gets a lot easier when you break it down into the daily goals versus looking at it from a year perspective. A thousand articles for a year sounds like a crap ton and it is. But at the same time, when you break it down to, you know, well, that's a hundred articles in a month. Okay, if that's 100 articles a month, how many articles that, you know, you're talking 25 articles a week. If that's 25 articles a week, now you're at three to four a day. How do you get to three or four a day? Probably not gonna be able to do it yourself if you're working full time, but if you're employing people, you might. If you've got several contractors, you can probably get there. Um, so setting goals early on was, was really, really important. I hope you're enjoying the podcast so far. Just wanted to take a short break and remind you that today's episode is sponsored by Search Intelligence. I've got a short clip from Ferry at Search Intelligence showing you how their agency built digital PR links to a client's website. This campaign got us big links in websites such as Lifehacker, Wells Online, Daily Record, and about 20 other news websites. Let me show you how we've done it. We knew that people will be flying a lot this summer, and we knew that journalists will be writing about this topic a lot. So, on behalf of our client, we put together a nice guide about how to fall asleep on the plane. Then we use Muckrack to find journalists who write about travel. Then we put our advice in a nice email and send the tips to the journalists. Within just a few days, the links started landing, securing our client natural placements in really big websites, just like this, this and this. This is a great example about how you can leverage seasonal trends to earn links to a website. Anticipate what journalists want to write about at all times and give them the stories that they need. They will reward you with some great juicy links. I hope this is helpful. Like what you just heard and are looking for similar link building PR campaigns for your website? Just go to search-intelligence.co.uk and get in touch with them today. What does a typical article look like when you're working with an expert? Like what kind of structure do you put into it? Um, One side says, hey, if I hired a doctor for my website, they're a doctor. They don't know how to write an article that's going to rank. So I got to give them a lot of uh, article, uh, like a brief or something like that. Another side says, hey, they're an expert. They better be able to figure it out. Actually, hiring an expert allows me to kind of take my foot off of having to be as involved. How did you get involved uh, with each expert that you were working with? What did a typical article, article structure look like? It's, it's a happy medium. So I think you can be a happy medium in there. You find people who can fit that happy medium mold where I can say, hey, I'm not going to give you an article brief on every single topic because that's if I'm going to do that, I may as well just write the article myself and have you do a fact check because um, it's easier at that point. So what I did was I came out with just style guides for specific types of content, whether it was a question and answer type article, um, list based piece or, or something like that, you know, whatever it is, whatever type of content is in, cause not all niches are going to be the same, right? Like, you know, if you're in, if you're in the, the sports gaming space, you're going to have a lot of like individual reviews or, or top 10 comparisons. Same thing with a lot of Amazon affiliate sites. Like, you know, my first, you know, multi six figure exit that I sold in, in 2018 was a primarily an Amazon affiliate site. Um, and so there were a lot of like best of and review guides, just take those templates and give it to you. Just make a generic template that says you need to hit X, Y, and Z. You give your writer the topic and you give them that template and say, this is what it needs to look like. And if you have competent writers, they should be able to replicate that kind. And so really you're, you're carving out your articles based on like intent is really what it comes down to because a, a product review is different than a, than a roundup review or an informational guide or a list based article. Like they've all got, they've all got different, you know, 
types of, of approaches to how you're going to, how you're going to write that content. But most of them are going to fall into that, that general wheelhouse. So just break it up. If you've got seven or eight pieces of content, there's seven or eight general types of content on your site, just create style guides for those and let your writers go nuts. Where'd you find master certified gardeners? I'm guessing they're not hanging out in the pro blogger, uh, uh, Facebook group. <laughs> Um, surprisingly, I did find a couple of them early on in, in pro blogger. Um, okay. but it's been like the, since then I haven't had to, to go back to that, that resource. Um, there's lots of different places uh, you can do. I mean, honestly, the best thing to do is just to go out to a, a, you know, LinkedIn or a job board and post a job and post it as hourly. A lot of people are still doing like you know, per word, which is fine. That's going to, that you'll get people who write in the, who do more industry specific writing, who are used to do like used to being paid per word. You can find a lot of people who, you know, just maybe want to write part time. If you just throw a job out there from an hourly perspective. So I'd say indeed, indeed.com, go out to indeed, post a job there for hourly LinkedIn, you know, make sure you've got a company page, post an hourly job on, on LinkedIn and, and put it out in front of, of real people. The nice thing is once you start to get organic traffic, people will ask if they can write for you. Um, another thing that we did that had some success was when we started growing our social media presence and we were on Facebook, we would just put, we would just put out a, a post and say, if you're interested in writing, fill, fill out this form here and people will come to your site. And once you've got a little bit of traffic and a little bit of credibility, you can attract people that come and write. Um, now being part of Epic Gardening, like we've got no shortage of writers. People, tons of people in the space want to write for us. It's great. It's a, it's a, a managing editor slash SEO professionals dream to have lots of qualified people and we have no shortage of that. So you were publishing 60 to 90 articles a month. Was that for the whole two years? Did you back off on that? Like how big of a deal is content velocity? How do you manage that? And how big of a role did it play in this site? Success? Yeah. That's a great question. And, and I may be, I may be exaggerating a little bit. I think we, so we did 60 and 90, but it may have been month six that we got there. I wanted to wait till we saw some, I wanted to see some dent in search console saying like, yeah, what you're doing is working rather than just dumping money down the drain. So I think the first six months we were doing more like 30 to 60 a month. And then once I saw the, once I started to see that hockey stick, I was like, okay, now we're ramping up to, to 90 a month. Um, so it's probably closer to month six. And then it was 90 to 110, uh, I shouldn't say 100, it was like 60 to like, I think the best month was like 100 pieces of content, 110-ish may have been like the max. Um, all real organic written certified writers, like no AI assistance, like real good homegrown content for like literally 16 months. Um, I do think content velocity is important. Um, it's hard to say, like, you know, I'm not, I'm, I don't write Google's algorithms. I can only tell people what works and it's crazy. Like I've learned to, like I try not to get into SEO theory crafting too much anymore because everybody's got a different opinion and someone's gonna listen to this and be like, oh, he's full of crap. Look, backlinks matter, content matters. Um, I don't build links. If anybody wants to ask that question, we'll get that out of the way right now. When you've got it, when you've got that's it, like next to my list, you blew it. You, you've got if you when you have a DR seventy one site on on all on uh, Epic Gardening, you don't have to build links. So we don't build links there. We get mentioned enough in the press now. We don't build links. Um, when I first started all about gardening, um, we did PR. We we promoted the site PR wise, um, but that you know that was that was really it. We did some acquisition. Um, I bought a, a site that was. Um, live out there in the space that had some traffic that was closely related in the gardening space. That was, a, we assumed that, um, but it had a great link profile. So, but I, you know, we assumed it because it had some traffic and it had some great content around a topic that we wanted to cover. And so it was like, it was an assumption. It wasn't like a purely SEO link building tactic. It was a, Hey, we're going to buy this business because it makes sense for us to do so. We're acquiring them, we're acquiring their traffic and we're, we're building it in. Um, much like Epic is doing with all about gardening. They, you know, they acquired me and, you know, we're, we're in the process of all about gardening will become Epic gardening. Like that's the, it's, it's, it's the exact same strategy. So, um, you know, to answer your question, 
it all matters. Content velocity matters because if Google sees you're not updating, you know, again, people are gonna are gonna disagree with me on here. If you're in an evergreen space, you can have a site and you can never touch it and it does fine. I would say that's there may be that circumstance out there, but in my experience, I have not seen very many sites that aren't getting actively worked on that that do well. Um, and I'm sure there's gonna be the anecdotal, you know, people are gonna say, here's a site that does well that never gets touched, maybe. Um, but I think content velocity and showing Google that there is somebody in there cranking out content on that site, whether it's updates, bringing new content in, you know, seeing, seeing activity on your site map, like Google algorithms love consistency, seeing a site that publishes 40 articles in a week and then doesn't do anything for six months. is far different than seeing a site that's publishing two or three a day, every single day for six to eight months. Like that's, there's consistency and algorithms love consistency. So um, again, it, content velocity matters um, it, to, to each their own. Um, you know, I would say if you can only start off doing one a day, that's great. That's better than most people are doing. Um, so just set, set the goal, but it does matter. It's, it, all, it all matters. All the things matter. Okay, I have like five questions from that rant there. Yeah, um, go ahead. <laughs> number one, I know your opinion on this, and I want you to maybe explain it more. I've got 100 articles to publish this month. Publish them all at once at the first of the month or drip them over the 30 days? Drip over 30 days, three a day, do, you know, three a day, 30 days, 90 pu published. There you go. Um, and You're again, strongly opinionated on that. Why? It, it comes back to, I believe, algorithms like consistency um, in, in every way, shape, and form. And so... Again, I don't, I don't write Google's algorithm. I don't have any scientific proof in any of this stuff. I can only tell you that this is what I've been doing and it works for me. Um, now, could I see the same success pushing out 100 all at once versus, and just leaving it for the end of the month? M maybe, it's possible. Um, I prefer not to do that because I look at it from, just look at it from an editorial publishing perspective. If you run the New York Post, does the New York Post push out 100 articles and then sit on their thumbs for the month? No, they publish 50 articles in a day and then they publish another 50 articles the next day. So when you think about it from what makes sense from an editorial perspective, that's what makes sense to me. If I'm building an editorial publication, I need content and I need to publish a lot of it. So that's my you know, perspective. People can disagree. Hey, do you, if you wanna go out and do 100 and it works for you, more power to you. That's just not how I do it and it's not how I will ever do it. At two years in on this site, where do you start looking at updating articles versus continuing to just push new content? And how do you evaluate that? That's a wonderful question. And I would say it's now. Um, I actually started building a content update process that I was going to roll out at like 18 months. Um, but that was around the time that, that Kevin and I started having some conversations. And so I was like, you know what, like, let's just keep jamming on new content because this whole strategy may look different six months from now. Um, but I started building that. And so we have a plan there. Even Epic's got some older content that we need to, to refine. Um, I think everybody like, look, once you've got a thousand articles on site, it's time to start updating your content. Um, that's really what I would say. If, if you've got 350 articles on your site and it's something that like information in your industry is rapidly changing. Now may be a wonderful time to start updating. It's going to be different for everybody. Um, but I think in, in a fairly evergreen space like gardening, you know, for us, you know, yeah, you want to update it once every you know year and a half or so to make sure you're still within best practices because, you know, different things change, new products come to market, you know, th things in the gardening space that people can use, like, you know, some of the raised garden, like Kevin's beds, the, uh, the, the birdies beds, like they're amazing, but they didn't exist a few years ago. They existed in the form of gardeners like me were going out. And, and when I first started, I was building them out of two by fours, but they didn't exist in the fact that they came like in ready-made kits. So stuff happens, um, in every industry, you know, if you, I'm sure people who listen to this podcast are in, you know, I used to be a gamer. I used to be a PC gamer and build my own PCs. And I, I love that stuff. And things change rapidly there. You know, you're, you're not going to do an article on the best graphics graphics units today and have it still be re relevant nine months from now. So it's going to change by industry, but you know, it really is it's, again, long story short, you need to update content. It will change based on your industry. I would say, look at what other sites around you are doing that are in the top 10 that are ranking well and, and mirror that. If you've got sites that 
are ranking well and aren't updating content in an industry that's rapidly changing, the good news is for you, if you update frequently, you could find ways to beat them because you're, you're, you've got more up-to-date information than they do. You said backlinks matter. You said do. you don't build backlinks. Yes. Um, I didn't check all about gardening, but it looks pretty authoritative from a backlink standpoint. How'd you, how'd you, how'd you manage to get there? Because um, if backlinks matter, you don't build them, but you get them, there's something there. Yeah, there was a, an acquisition that we made on a, on a site that um, was all about a specific flower type. And so we acquired them plus their traffic. That helped build some authority there. But really after that, it was um, we did some, some studies. I uh, did some specific plant-based studies um, that were unique that got picked up on, you know, that we promoted via PR and got picked up in multiple publications, which helped. Um, but I will also say that hiring experts really helped us too, because one of our, our writers was credentialed and published in university publications. And when we started publishing, she started getting picked up in more university publications and they were linking back. So there's, there's, look, there's lots of ways to skin the backlink cat, so to speak. I remember when, you know, back in the day when Spencer had PBNs, you know, P the, the PBN discussions and those were all the rage and like, the, you know, there's, there's lots of ways to do, to do that, to do the, the, the backlink discussion. I still feel like the easiest way to do it is just to set yourself up as a brand, create content that's share worthy. And I know that sounds stupid. And so many people are going to be like, you need to just go and buy backlinks or pay for them. Look, maybe in certain spaces you need to go and do that. But coming from sports betting and seeing that we were the best links that we got were from publishing these incredible studies or, or really funny studies that would get picked up on like, you know, the, the drunkest fans or something like that for a specific city would get picked up and go viral in these locations. They get picked up in Reddit. They get picked up other places. Like creating something that's truly share worthy is always going to be your best bet because you're never going to be able to replicate viral links unless you've got a massive budget. So I truly to this day, I don't, I don't build links. I haven't built links. I haven't even done like, I haven't built links in years to be honest with you. Like, like we did some PR early days of all about gardening to establish ourselves. Um, but that was, that was really it. Um, and so I'm just a firm believer in you'll pick them up as you go. Content is definitely more important. If you're finding that you're publishing a lot of content and you're not getting, um, the movement that you need, then it comes down to like, who can we reach out to, to start, you know, maybe doing some studies and promoting some of the stuff that we do from a PR perspective. And I think those are some of the better links that you can get. And again, I know people are going to disagree with me. That's fine. Um, you can still get, you know, you can definitely do outreach for industry-based links. Um, I'm sure stuff like that helps, but it's just not a, it's not a major focus of mine anymore. Don't worry. The more people that disagree, the more comments we get on YouTube, the better our engagement. <laughs> totally fine. Have at it, people. Uh, last question for you before we move on to the epic gardening transition. Yeah. Very open-ended. Topical authority. And as it relates to all about gardening... I mean, we talk, topical authority is all the rage these days. What it like, talk about it. I'm going to leave it very open ended for you. We've talked about links. We've talked about uh, having uh, expert writers and expert contributors. We've talked about um, uh, uh, backlinks, all these things. Like, where does topical authority fit into the success of all about uh, uh, all about gardening? Yeah, it matters. Um, you know, when we had one of our houseplant authors go viral and get mentioned in a multiple publications. Um, you know, that helps, um, especially when you've got a lot of, you know, when you've got a, a segment on a certain topic like we do on houseplants. Um, so that, that matters. Um, but what I would say from a content perspective, I think, you know, you want to start, and this is, this has been echoed. There are a lot of people who, who would preach the same thing. You want to start broad, a broad space for your niche and zero in on something that you can produce a lot of content around before moving outside of that. So, you know, if you're, if you're starting off in, you know, if you're building a website about the NFL, start about, start with your favorite team, you know, start with the, the, for me, it's my whole family's originally from Minnesota. We like the Vikings. So if I was going to start a website on the NFL and do a, a sports website, I'd start a site on the NFL, but I would start with the Minnesota Vikings and I would have evergreen content about the Minnesota Vikings. And I would have news articles about the Minnesota Vikings. I would have all sorts of content within that context of that 
niche. And once I started to see myself get some traffic in that space, I would say, okay, what's next? Now I'm going to go within the NFC North, which is in the same division. So now I'm going to do Green Bay, Detroit, and Chicago. Those are the three teams that are in the Minnesota's division. Um, I'm trying to think if there's a better analogy to this because there might be a lot of people who don't like football. But my point is, stay within your hub to start. Um, you know, it could be it could be anything. You know, like look look at niche pursuits. It could be it could be Spencer's got it. You know, he's got his blog that's all about digital marketing. Well, he's got a, a certain subset about how to make money online. Well, within how to make money online, there is affiliates, there is um, e-commerce, there is SEO. And so you're going to have these little hubs, Mm -hmm. so to speak, of content that you're going to want to focus on. And I would say build out those hubs. And a lot of people are going to use the term silos or clusters, whatever you want to call it. I don't care. Just start in your lane first before you start to get some traffic and then move on to the next one once you start seeing some success. That's, That's how I would do it. And that's how I am doing it. I'm starting. I'm starting a new site. Um, I've been working on it for for a few months. Um, I'm not going fast, but I'm starting on a new site. I'm, and and uh, it's one that we had owned for a while. That's been sitting out there on the sidelines that my wife wanted to get into. That now I'm just like, hey, you know, we'll, we might toy around with that at some point, but it's not a priority. Um, but it's how I'm going to build that out, and how I'd run recommend anybody starting from scratch start within your lane and grow big. Um, I don't like the term silos clustering, I guess, if you want to use that term, that's fine. But I don't believe the term, like, I don't believe in like strict siloing or anything like that. Like if you've got, you know, if you're going to link to, if you're going to like build internal links, link where it makes sense, you know, that's a whole, like we could go into the SEO weeds, like that's a whole other topical discussion. But at the end of the day, I believe just link where it makes sense. Yes. If you've got a, 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 you know, if you've got Spencer's content hub about SEO, it's going to make more sense to interlink to other topics on SEO than it is to link to e-commerce or other things. But don't let that limit you. Like you could still link to other things if it makes sense for the reader. So, um, you know, very loose on how internal links go. But as far as content is concerned, that's how I would start. Hopefully that, that makes sense. No, totally. Well, we've had Kevin on the show recently on the podcast. So yeah. it's quite apropos that now we have you on. Um, because you're part of Kevin's team. So Epic Gardening and All About Gardening are now under the same umbrella. How the heck did that come to be? So this was, we started talking a while ago. We started talking uh, sometime last year. And um, he had put out a, an, uh, like a, a message in the Authority Hacker Pro group and said, hey, I'm looking to hire a director of search. And I was still in the sports space that time. I'd had the site and I'd had All About Gardening that was doing well. And I was like, it, it, this was around the time where I was like, I'm going to like, I knew that like, I knew that I was going to need to branch out to different types of content. We started dabbling in YouTube, doing some things. And I was like, I'm just not comfortable enough there yet. And I'm just an SEO guy. Like that's, I'm a, I'm a publisher. Like I love, I love to, I love to publish. Um, I love working in the SEO space. That's what I do. And I just made the decision look like I'm probably never going to be a YouTuber. I'm never going to be an Instagrammer. I'm never going to do all those things. So what's what's that look like for me? What's next step of progression? Kevin posted his job that he was looking for a director of search. I had been in the sports industry for three and a half years. And I was like, look, it probably makes sense. Like I love I loved where I was at at Better Collective. They're a great company, great benefits, great people. Made a lot of really great contacts there. Um, but it was just time. Like, you know, I was ready to move on to something different and and try something else perfect timing. He was there and I just reached out and we had been in, we had been in that group together for a couple of years. We didn't really know each other directly. Um, but indirectly we did I have a lot of the same friends. We'd chime in on a lot of the same conversations on Facebook or wherever. Um, and so I just messaged him and said, Hey, this is my site. Like we'd love for us to chat. And, and he said, yeah, this makes sense. Um, let's, you know, we should chat sometime. And then it, like a couple months went by and we really just, both of us got busy. We didn't chat. And finally I was like, Hey, like we just need to talk. And so I sent him a screenshot of href saying, Hey, like this is my site. I'm interested in your direct search director role. It doesn't look like you guys have hired yet. If you want to talk, let's, let's talk. And he saw that and he was like, yeah, he's like, we've been growing rapidly. This makes sense. Let's get a discussion. And so, uh, it was literally a week later, me, him and his, uh, interim COO at the time, um, had a chat and then things just came together from there. Um, I think, Something I, I want to talk about is like people will probably ask like why if your site's doing so well, why wouldn't you just jump from your your day job to being on your own? In fact, that was a question Kevin asked me when we were first talking is like why not just be on your own? Um, and it's it's you know there's multiple prongs to this, but the the first thing that came to mind was what I just mentioned. I knew I wasn't going to be a YouTuber. I was not going to go into an area where I felt like were not my strengths. 
looking at, at Epic, they had been growing the blog, but with limited resources because other channels were more profitable for them. So it didn't talk about that on the podcast. Yeah. Yeah. They they just, it didn't, it didn't make sense for them to invest a lot. Well, I could show him from day one that my site was doing really well. And there was this, I mean, he knew there was opportunity, but he had kind of felt like, I think, um, that they hadn't put enough attention on the blog, like they should have. And this was an opportunity for him to not only like increase reach overall for his brand, but bring somebody in who's, who literally has tripled traffic from his site that he had for six years and did it in under, under two years on a different domain to bring somebody in who has this, this kind of expertise and, and to run it for him. And so it, it just really was like, I knew I wasn't going to go, go social media side. I knew I wasn't going to turn all about gardening into this, like into an e-commerce brand, but I saw everything Kevin was doing. And I was like, this just makes too much sense for me to still be able to focus on all my strengths and him to do what he's doing and, and bring all this stuff together. Another, another piece of this too, was he has, he has really great systems and te- uh, systems in place for his teams. Um, and, and I did too, on the editorial side, he does it for, you know, he has great teams and teams in place for the e-commerce side. So it's really, again, just like natural transition of like, I got all these amazing writers that I can, uh, yeah. you know, that just were kind of like, Hey, we get to write for a different publication. Like, it's just, it, it just really worked out. Um, and then I got, you know, like in, in my space now, something that I was thinking about all about gardening, we didn't have like a horticulturalist or a botanic, like I knew we were going to need either a horticulturalist or a botanist to really go back through and, and revise old content and make sure like a lot of the, the scientific names of the plants were, you know, cause the scientific names of plants can change. Um, the readers on or listeners of the, the blog or podcast probably won't know that, but they can plants change as they get updated, they get reclassified. And I knew I was going to need either a botanist or a horticulturalist to come on to all about gardening and do some work. Kevin's got one and she's amazing. And so like that, like already right away, I was like, this is great. This solves the need for me. And so when we start to like do this merge, like we've got all these things built in that I was just like, this is awesome. Um, so yeah, so we, we started talking, it took us a few months to hammer out all the details, but I left uh, better collective in March and haven't looked back and it's been, it's been great. So we're still publishing on, on both domains. Uh, Epic gardening is getting, you know, it's gotten a facelift. We did a, we did a, a redesign. We took the theme that all about gardening had and we revamped it and applied epic branding and so epic's got the the new blog theme which i know he tweeted out a while ago that we had a new new theme that's where that came from is we took the aag theme and reskinned it um because it just worked well um and so i mean just a lot of a lot of things that synchronize that are that are going well and so now we're all team epic and it's you know we're it's great. Like I just, we've been expanding further. I just hired a managing editor, um, a week ago. She just, she just started this week. And so she's going to be in charge of, uh, day-to-day publications. And that's going to let me kind of zoom out and I'm still going to be heavily involved on SEO with the blog, but I'm going to be doing more of a, a broad focus on, um, you know, we own botanical interests, which is a seed brand that he owns that he recently acquired, uh, late last year. So I'll be doing some e-commerce th- SEO there with Shopify and, um, you know, with the, the, the Epic shop, like there's just, there's so much opportunity out there. Um, and so, yeah, for me, so again, just to kind of wrap up this rant, it's just, it just made, there were too many levels that it made sense for us not to, to join forces. And now it's just, it's going to be a force to be reckoned with in the gardening space. It's great. We're all, we're all on the same page. So the burning SEO question is, are you going to merge the domains or keep them separate? We will be merging. Um, and so we will all be Epic at one point. And I think that Kevin's even, um, come out and basically said that in his, in his tweets that he's pushed out. So this isn't like, you know, some, some state secret that, that we're doing. Um, because when we do that, we are, when we merge the two of those, we, we should be the second or third most trafficked gardening domain in the entire industry, um, at that point. So, and we will go, we'll go from, you know, 13 or 1400 pieces of content on both sites to, you know, 28, 2900 pieces of content overnight when we do it. Um, shouldn't be overnight. We're probably going to migrate into stages, but it'll, it, we're going to, we're going to have a lot of content. So it's going to be a fun, fun activity. Just to, for people listening, because, you know, at different levels and at different stages, probably different, uh, every website owner runs into this conversation at some point. Why, um, what would be the use case for not merging the two brands? I think the use case for that would be like better collective. They had, um, they had, you know, multiple sites out there that they ran in their portfolio. I think 
if you're gonna go different levels topically, it makes sense. Um, you know, like if you're gonna do fantasy sports on one site and sports betting on another, that makes a lot of sense to differentiate. Um, for us, for Epic and All About Gardening, I think it makes sense to join because Kevin's largely focused on edibles, um, edible content. Uh, so, you know, gardening with tomatoes, cucumbers, et cetera. That's been their, their primary focus where we've been focused a lot more ornamentals. Um, and so that's been a big focus for us. Like I'm a, I love dahlias. Dahlias are my favorite flower. I've grown them for a few years and I've got like 60 different cultivars out in my, my garden this season that I absolutely love. So, we, you know, we're going to have the opportunity to take like two sites that really only have like 15 to 20% overlap and merge them. Mm. Um, I would say if you have two sites that have a lot of overlap, it may not make sense to do that because you're going to be eating away at the traffic. You're going to be taking pages where you're just going to be redirecting the two of them together. And then I would say the only benefit in really doing that is if you've got like two, two pages that are ranked seven and eight, maybe you can merge the two of them and now you're getting to, to, to ranked two or three. And so you're going to get a bigger share of the traffic being in positions one, two or three might make sense to do that. Um, but if you're in a position where you've got uh, two sites, same niche, and you've got position one and you've got position four, probably not going to be really worth it to, to merge the two of those. Um, it just depends on how you're playing, how you're playing the game. Um, for us, because we are playing it in a way where we have uh, content that only has a 20% overlap, it's going to make sense for us to create just one massive resource for gardeners of all types. Who, um, that was that was all that was so much information and um, I'll say a couple of things first off you were right we have been working on this interview for years probably it's long <laughs> overdue yeah um, and congratulations on Thanks. on the merger uh, the you know the, the new the new horizons and everything Thanks. I mean uh, like we, I think a lot of us have followed along Kevin's journey for a while and so it's just really cool to see you know, the growth and see these cool opportunities coming up and, um, uh, congrats on it. Thanks, man. He's got a, he's got a great team. Um, we're, it's, we're still growing and so we're expanding. So, you know, for all of those listeners out there, if you've got some plant experience and you're in the digital marketing space, if we're hiring at some point, feel free to reach out to me because it's a growing, growing space. Um, something I, I do want to just, you know, say kind of my, my parting thought, if you don't mind, um, it's so funny for the longest time. And I think Spencer's listeners may get tied up into this too. Like I felt like I needed to like do the thing that would like replace my day job income and make the jump to like be my own person and be my own entrepreneur. Um, and that's awesome. Like I, there are a lot of people who want to do that and that's for them, but there's also a lot of like, I, I thought that way for a long time. And then when this opportunity came up, I, I, you know, re reflecting now being here for a few months and people are probably going to say, oh, he's going to say that because he's only been there for a few months, but it's, it's legit. Like when you're doing something you really enjoy and you're doing it with people that you enjoy being around, that makes more of a difference than anything. Um, and so for me, like, yeah, being on my own at some point, maybe down the road, I'm not, I'm so focused on Epic right now. Like I said, I have a new project that I'm working on. That's going to be down the line, something that I'll, that I'll kind of toy with, but like success isn't linear. Like it doesn't all have to go like, you know, you start, you're working this day job and you're, you're building this thing that has to replace your day job income. So you can be on your own. It doesn't always have to be like that. My advice is if you, if you're in a day job that you hate and you want this thing to like liberate you, just find a different day job that you like and keep doing this thing on the side that can help, you know, fund your, your hobbies or whatever it is that you want to do. And if it someday replaces your day job income, that's great. And you can go as, as, as hard or as light as you want into that. But just, I guess the, the parting thought is like, don't feel like if, you know, you're not out there on your own doing your own thing, that it's, it's not a success. You can, it, it doesn't all have to just go one way. There are lots of different ways you can take a, a digital marketing career. And I am absolute proof of that. Well, I, I couldn't piggyback uh, more on. I mean, I, I have no aspirations, at least at this stage, of taking my websites full time. I, but uh, and you know, I don't have a job where I work for someone, but I have an agency that I run on the day on the yeah. you know on the on the full time, and this is my side hustle. So you know, there's so many different ways to go about it, right? And yeah. success can be a lot more defined by what you value than by what maybe you think the ultimate goal is. It's funny, Spencer's been beating that into my head too. Like you know, when I when I say, hey, like you know, you guys. 
this is funny. Like when I had my first seven figure exit and I was just like, someday I'll be like you guys where I, you know, we have this big exit and I'm still on my own. And Spencer was like, dude, you just had like this massive exit just to enjoy it a little bit. And he's right. Like it doesn't, it doesn't look the same for everybody. So celebrate the, the wins when you have them. And, uh, that's it. That's all I got, man. The website's epicgardening.com. Where can people get in touch with you if they want to reach out? Yeah, um, I don't tweet, but I'm on Twitter at Income Jar. It's at Income Jar. That was my domain that I was going to start a, a blog at some point in my life, and maybe I still will. Um, I have no idea, but I don't do anything with it yet. But you can hit me up there on Twitter. I consume a lot on Twitter because I follow every SEO account you can you can imagine, and uh, I try and stay up to date on trends just because that's a great place to, to do that. So you can reach me there. You can also reach me at jwilson at epicgardening.com, uh, either one of those places if anybody wants to stay in touch. Well, Jason, it's been long overdue. Thank you for coming on. That uh, hour plus flew by. Um, and, uh, hey, much continued success, and, uh, uh, you know, look forward to catching up with you again soon. Thank you, sir. Appreciate it. Great chatting. Today's episode is sponsored by Search Intelligence. Here's a short clip of Ferry from Search Intelligence showing you how their agency built digital PR links to a client's website. We got tiny links and placements on massive websites such as The Express, Mirror, Daily Record and many more with a campaign about the pros and cons of popular diets. Mm, not bad. This is exactly how we've done it. Our client is a very popular fitness client. We have asked them to provide thorough expert commentary about the pros and cons of the most popular diets. Once we have this information, we put this in a nice email and send it out to 15,000, yes, 15,000 journalists from around the world that write about fitness. So good. And all healthy. Big publications picked up our story from the email, giving our client massive, juicy, saucy, healthy links that are 100% relevant to their website and that will keep the rankings of the website in a great shape. You see what I've done there? I hope this case study inspires and that you will start leveraging expert commentary type campaigns to land links to your or your client's website just like we've done it with this campaign. Thanks for joining us today on the podcast. Just a final reminder that it was brought to you by Search Intelligence. And if you're looking for link building PR campaigns for your website, just head over to search-intelligence.co.uk and get in touch with them today. Cheers.